And we're looking at the different things that God has to develop within us if we're going to go from success to significance. There's so many people, they only live for success. But success without the next generation, without reaching your potential, is never significant. The sixth lesson we're going to talk about, commitment. Commitment. In developing the relationships with each other, we've got to make commitment to each other. And we're going to see how this develops in the life of Elijah and Elisha. Let me read the text. It says, and it came to pass when the Lord was about to take Elijah into heaven by a whirlwind, that Elijah went with Elisha from Gilgal. Then Elijah said to Elisha, stay here, please, for the Lord has sent me on to Bethel. But Elisha said, as the Lord lives and as your soul lives, I will not leave you. So they went down to Bethel. You find that in 2 Kings, the second chapter, verses 1 and 2. This is the end of the story of Elijah and Elisha. Now, something that I've got to emphasize is both Elijah and Elisha were prophets to Israel, to the northern ten tribes. This is after Israel has divided into the northern and southern kingdoms. It's during the times of the kings of Judah. This was not a good time to be a prophet of Jehovah. In fact, when we studied the story, we discovered that Elisha's ministry was largely not from Jerusalem, but from the city of Samaria. Samaria was the capital of the northern kingdom. So it wasn't a good time to be a worshiper of Jehovah as far as the culture was concerned. The culture was worshiping idols. The two particular ones that they talked about was Baal and Asherah that they assumed was husband and wife, you know, these idols that they are worshiping. So it's a very difficult time for them. And yet, both of these men have effective ministries, though the kingdom of Israel never had one good king. Every king that they had was an ungodly king. And yet, they had effective ministries. Now, what that says to you and I, our culture does not control us, nor does it de determine the significance of our life. God can use our life in a dramatic way, in, in a wonderful way, in difficult times. It's been well said, the lights shine brightest in the darkest hour. And that is so true. And that's what we see in both Elijah and Elisha's life. Now, if we're going to make a lasting impact on the next generation, we've got to remember God never gives up on people. We do. God doesn't. Thank God. God is not a man. He doesn't give up on people. He, can, he continues to reach out to us and to deal with us the rest of our lives. It's very interesting the change that's happened in Elijah. Remember, he was the loner, the one that liked to be alone at the brook, the one that liked to be alone in ministry, the one that separated himself from other friends. But notice, when he comes to the end of his life, we don't know exactly how this information was communicated to them, but everybody seemed to know it. This was Elijah's last day to live. Elijah is going to be with God today. They knew it was the last day. What does Elijah choose to do? He chose to spend the last day of his life with his preacher boys. What a transformation has happened in his life. The loner is no longer a loner. He recognizes the value of relationships. And so he wants to be with them. I ask you the question, if you knew you had 24 hours to live, how would you spend your time? Who would you choose to be with? This was Elijah's decision. And so since this is the last day of Elijah's life, he designed some 
final exams for his students. I want to talk about those final exams. Here's the first one, the test of loyalty. Now I start there because this seems to be Elijah's favorite test. This is the one he goes to again and again, the test of loyalty. How can we test loyalty? How do you know if people are loyal, if they are committed? Well, the way that Elijah tested them, he gave them an opportunity to turn back, to go back. Jesus did the same thing. Remember the time when the multitudes were departing from Jesus and he turns around to his 12 disciples, apostles, and he says, do you also want to go away with them? In other words, he was leaving the door wide open saying, if you want to go, here's your chance. You can go with them. And Peter, who was always quick on the trigger as far as the tongue, he says immediately, where are we going to go, Lord? You're the only one that have the words of eternal life. Boy, that was the truth. That was the truth. He got that one right exactly. How do you give a test of loyalty? He gives him the opportunity of turning back. And you find that in the story three times. Three times, Elijah says to Elisha, stay here, stay here. Now here, here's the test of loyalty. And three times, Elisha passes the test. And he said, the way he put it, he basically saying, as long as you're alive and God doesn't die, I'm sticking with you. He's saying, as long as the Lord God dies, we know God's not going to die. And he's saying, as long as you're alive, I'm not leaving you. Wow. That is the test of loyalty. Now, here's what I learned from this. Loyalty is hearing what your leader said, but understanding what he meant. In other words, Elijah says to Elisha, stay here. Do you think Elijah really wanted him to stay there? No. Or he wouldn't have used the word, please. You don't see Elijah going around saying, if you please. No, that, that's not Elijah. Elijah, he's rough and tough. I mean, he's to the point. He points his finger and, and tells you what to do. He's always commanding, but not this time. He's saying, stay here, please. No, he's testing him. He didn't really want him to stay there. If he had, he would have commanded him to stay there. But it was a test. And Elisha recognizes that. He heard what he said, but he understood what he meant, that this is a test of loyalty. Now, something else I notice in this is Elisha was only one of many of what they call the school of the prophets. Now, we don't know exactly how this was set up, but in different places in northern Israel, they had started these, what today we would probably call Bible schools, school of the prophets. And they were studying under the leadership of Elijah. They were studying how to worship God, how to follow God, how then we're talking about Jehovah God here. Because remember, the whole country is given over to idolatry now. And, and you hear what it says in 2 Kings the second chapter in verse three. Now the sons of the prophets who were at Bethel. This is one of those Bible schools they have. They come out to Elisha and they're saying, don't you know your master is going to be taken away today? Now here's, here's what I, I see in that. They're devoted to God. They know this is the last day for Elijah to live. What is so important that they don't follow him? I, I, I ask you and I the same question. What is it that stops us and keeps us from following God, from making the commitment? It takes more than just a love for God to produce loyalty. And that's why I think we have a lot of people that they, oh, I love Jesus. It's Christians I can't stand. And so, uh, you know, I can't find a church that's good enough to go to. It's amazing. So many people are so spiritual, they can't go to church. Who do you think you're kidding? Oh, God help us. That's what's happening here. They love God. They're sons of the prophets, 
but they're not committed to Elijah even though they know it's the last day of his life. The second thing I learned concerning this, it takes more than information to produce loyalty. Now, as I said, they knew this was the last day of Elijah's life. You find again in, in 2 Kings 2 and 3 where he says, they're talking to Elisha. Do you not know that the Lord will take away your master from over you today? And of course, Elisha knew it. And his response was, yes, I know it. Just be quiet. I don't want to hear it. I'm sticking with Elijah. Now, it takes more than a love for God. It takes more than a love for knowledge to produce loyalty. In fact, it's one of the things I've discovered. So many people are like, it said of the men of Athens, they are ever learning something new. And there are some people that's committed to that. They love knowledge, but they don't love the ones that have brought them that knowledge. See, where loyalty comes from, loyalty comes out of a committed relationship. I give a picture here, and I love this picture of an older couple that's walking, helping each other along. And I, I, I think that, that that's uh, actually Dale and Evelyn there. That's, uh, that, that's who that is, 50 years of marriage, and I can't see where we're going. And uh, she can see, but she just keeps falling down, so I had to keep her steady, you know. And so we're supporting each other. Committed relationships. Wow. That's the only way you make it 50 years. And it's why you have so few people that celebrate their golden anniversary because they don't have the commitment to each other. If you're going to overcome and pass the test of loyalty, you're going to have to make a commitment. Now, let me give you the second test. The second test that I see that Elijah gives this final day, he gives it to Elisha. It's what I call the test of desire, the test of desire. They're walking along, they're going down the road, and I'll read it for you in 2 Kings 2 and 9. And so it was when they had crossed over, over the Jordan River, that Elijah said to Elisha, ask, what do you want me to do for you before I am taken away from you? Wow, not everybody hears those words because they don't pass the test of loyalty. He's passed the test of loyalty, so now... It's the second test, the test of desire. What do you want? Boy, that's a good question. A very good question to ask. In other words, we, we, we can put basically in three different areas. What do you want? Do you want what is in his hand? Now, I deal with the poor a lot. A lot of my life has been spent ministering to extremely poor people. And it's one of the things I've asked God to help me, never to become calloused or hardened toward the poor. God loves the poor. And for the poor, many times, all they can see is what's in your hand. You have some money, would you help us? Would you give it to us? Now, of course, the truth is you can't give it to everybody. It's impossible to help all the poor. Nobody can do that. But for many people, that's all they want is what's in your hand. Give me your resources. Give me what you have. The second question that you should ask is, do we want what's in his head? Not just what's in his hand. But what's in his head? See, if, if I knew what you know, I probably could do what you do. For instance, I, I watch musicians as they're playing and, oh, they can make such beautiful music from the keyboards or from the guitar. And I, I watch them and, and, oh my, I would love to do that. But I don't know what they know. Now, there's nothing wrong with my fingers. My fingers work quite well. There's something wrong with my head, with my knowledge. If I knew what they know, then I could do what they do. 
But because I don't, I'm limited to my lack of understanding. Oh, that's where a lot of people stop in their quest of life. In their quest for significance, they just want knowledge. Like the sons of the prophets that I said failed the test of loyalty. They knew the right information. Elijah's going home today, but they didn't follow. Do you want what's in his hand or what's in his head or what's in his heart? Do we want what is in his spirit? Now, thank God, Elisha had built the kind of relationship with Elijah. He knew what he wanted. I think the problem for so many people, they've never stopped. and They've never even thought it through. They don't even know what they want yet. Until you know what you want, then how will you know when you got it? God, help us to be able to define that. Elisha knew what he wanted. He says to him, Please, let a double portion of your spirit be upon me. Boy, he got it right. He got it right. I don't know when it happened in Elisha's life. The the Bible scholars estimate that Elisha has been with Elijah now for approximately eight years. Approximately eight years, he's been following the old prophet, just serving him, pouring water on the hands of Elijah. Anything he can do, to help the old prophet. But somewhere in this journey, in this relationship, somewhere Elisha had discovered Elijah's secret. How does he call fire down from heaven? How does he raise boys from the dead? How does he do these miraculous things? Elisha had discovered it. It's in his spirit. The miracles were the result of Elijah's relationship with God. He understands that's the source. That's the secret of the old prophet's power. That's where this anointing comes from. And that's what he's saying. I want a double portion of your spirit. Now God bless him. May God bless him. May God bless young people. Oh yes, it takes a young person to look at an old prophet like Elijah and say, I want twice the ministry that you've got. Wow. And the truth is, that's what God did for him. Thank God for young people. They believe they can do the impossible. And therefore, they do it. Because they believe in the impossible, it becomes possible for them. Oh, looking at the greatest prophet since Moses and saying, I want twice the ministry you have. It tells us Elisha is a young man. But thank God, He passed the test. He knew what he wanted. And the old prophet said to him, what you're asking is a very difficult thing. Nevertheless, if you see me when I am taken away from you, it will be given to you. That brings me to my third test. The third test I want to talk about is the test of vision. The test of vision. He said to Elisha, if you see me, When I'm taken away from you, there's the third test. The test of vision. See, it's what you see that determines what you receive. That's more than just a play on words. It is a spiritual truth. And so many people are seeing the wrong thing. I remember the old preacher that said, I read the newspaper to see what God is doing. I wonder how many of us can say that. I watch the evening news to see what God did today. No, what most of us see is what the devil is doing. Isn't it amazing? So many people even come to God's house, come to church and see what the devil is doing. They pick out all the problems, all the faults, everything they don't like. How about seeing what God is doing? If you see me when I'm taken away, then you will receive it. What we see determines what we receive. It's this lack of vision that's the major cause of failure in so many lives. We're looking at the wrong things. We're not looking at God 
We're not looking at what God is doing. We're seeing what somebody else is doing. In other words, focusing on the wrong object will keep us from our reward. It will keep us from reaching our destination. Focusing on the wrong object is going to keep us from living a life of significance. If our life is really going to make a difference, we're going to have to see what God sees and look at life from God's perspective. Thank God, Elisha got it right. Now, let, let me point out something here I think is, is, is highly significant. Seeing this test of vision is more than just being able to see our leader. That's important. We must see our leader. But to be able to see, it means we've got to see more than our leader. We've got to be able to see what our leader sees. Let me repeat that because I believe that is very significant. It's not enough just to see our leader. So many times we see that. The pastor is speaking or our spiritual leaders are speaking and, and we see them but we don't see what they are seeing. Do you understand? Until we can see what they see, then we're not going to pass the test of vision. For instance, in this story, Elijah and Elisha are walking together and I'm sure Elijah, Elisha is probably tripping over quite a few things that day because Elijah had already told him, if you see me when I'm taken away, and he doesn't know when that's going to happen. And so I'm sure he's watching Elijah more than he's watching the rocks and the holes in the road. And, uh, but he keeps watching Elijah. He doesn't want to miss this. He doesn't want to fail this test. And suddenly, boy, there's some things in life that that's the way they happen. Suddenly. Suddenly, here comes horses and chariots of fire and parts them. They're walking together and suddenly they're rushing between them. They're separated by horses and chariots of fire. Elisha not only sees Elijah, Elisha saw what Elijah saw. He saw the same thing. And, and, and as Elijah is taken up into heaven with a whirlwind. Now, that's when you begin to see how close this relationship had come for them. They had been bonded together. They were like father and son. In fact, that's what he says. Elisha begins to cry out, my father, my father. Now, we know he's not speaking naturally. He had already kissed his father and mother goodbye so he could follow the old prophet. He's speaking spiritually here. Elijah has become like a spiritual father to him. And that's what he's talking about. I find it very interesting. Elisha doesn't cry out, my God, my God. He doesn't say, my prophet, my prophet. No, he says, my father, my father. Because he recognizes something in this old gentleman that he wants in himself. I want to be like you when I grow up. Now the truth of it is, the only thing that refuses to die with a man of God is the integrity of his character. That's the only thing you cannot take to the graveyard. You can take their money. And I know of some people that's, I believe very foolishly, been buried in their automobiles. You can take your car with you. You can take a lot of things, but one thing you cannot take is integrity, who you really were, the person that you were that refuses to die with them. That's what we find in this story. See, the ministry of Elijah does not end when he departed from this world. Not at all. No, Elisha picks up the mantle that he drops to him, the same mantle that had touched his shoulders, and he works twice as many miracles as Elijah had done. He had asked for a double portion. He received what he asked for. 
His ministry doesn't end. Now the other prophets, they, they looked at Elisha and this is what they said in 2 Kings 2 and 15. The spirit of Elijah rests upon Elisha. That's the truth. That's exactly what happened. The anointing was now upon Elisha's life. Now, some, some of these prophets, they, the, the, these are the school of the prophets, they refused to believe that Elijah's really gone and so they wanted to go look for him. There's always someone that's out looking for a dead leader. You're not gonna find him any more than they found him. Elisha understood this was the end of one era and it was time for another era to begin. And so he picks up the mantle and begins his ministry. And God uses Elisha to fulfill the word that he had given to Elijah. Remember when he said, I want you to go and anoint Haziel to be king of Syria. I want you to anoint Jehu to be king of Israel. When did that happen? It happened under the life of Elisha. Elisha fulfilled the vision that God had given to Elijah. And then when you read the story, you discover that there was enough power in the very bones of Elisha to resurrect the dead. You find the second Kings, the 13th chapter and verse 21. And when they, the Israelites put the man in the tomb of Elisha, when the man was let down and touched the bones of Elisha, he revived and stood on his feet. I've often wondered if they were running away from the Syrians or from a resurrected dead man. But uh, either way, the, the Israelites outrun the enemy. And so there's power that is there. See, the truth of it is, God is a God of the next generation. He is a God that never quits. And if we're going to live a life of significance, we must commit ourselves to a younger generation, raise up another generation that will help us reach our significance. May God help each one of us to learn to live a life of significance.